So when I was a little girl, my dream, um, it, and it all starts, this, this dream that I had when I was eight years old, it all starts with Dennis the Menace, okay? I could identify with Dennis. He was a kid who had wonderful intentions, great big ideas, poor execution. But he never gave up. The most fascinating thing to me about Dennis, however, was that he lived in a mobile home. So I wanted to grow up, move to the United States, and live in a mobile. That was my dream. My perception of Americans before I came to live here was very much shaped by what I saw on TV. So my second idea of Americans, the first one being that all of you live in mobile homes, was that everyone was beautiful, rich, and white, just like the characters from the original Beverly Hills 991. But then I got here, and my sixth grade classroom looked like this. There were Asian people, and there were black people, although Mark is absent the day we took this picture. And there were people who looked like me, except none of them spoke Spanish. And I thought that was a little strange. When I first came here, I spoke four words of English. And I learned those four words from a Sesame Street song that went something like this. Pollito, chicken, gallina, hen, lapis, pencil, y pluma, hen. And even though that is all the English I knew, my parents enrolled me in an all-English class. They thought that would be the fastest way for me to learn English. I thought they were trying to torture me. And so that first day of school, I didn't speak to anyone, except I kept repeating that song in hopes that I would remember to order chicken at the lunch line. And of course, when I got there, I just pointed at the thing I thought looked like chicken. I think it was sausage or something. Um, and my teacher noticed my struggle, so she assigned me a buddy. My buddy's name was Kendra. Kendra had blonde hair and blue eyes. She was the only person in my class that spoke Spanish. I was really, really confused, okay? So upon arriving in America, I learned two very important lessons. The first one being that I couldn't let my entire perception of America, or of anything really, be shaped by what I saw on TV. Because if I did that, I was bound to miss something. I was bound to have an incomplete picture. And the second lesson I learned is that if I ever wanted to have any friends, I needed to learn how to speak English. So, once I had the English thing under control, I quickly fell in love with everything American. Football and cheerleading, Chinese food, the French Prince of Bel-Air, Nirvana, and with this idea that everything in America was possible, that no matter where I came from or what I had, I could make something better of myself. My mother was the biggest believer in the American dream, and she instilled those ideas in me from the very first day I came to live here. Until I was 11 years old, I lived with my grandmother in Mexico. My parents owned a business in the U.S., and so they traveled back and forth. I don't have any kids, but I can imagine that for any parent, it would be very difficult to be away from their child for months at a time, even if that reason was to give their child a better life. My parents oftentimes spend months here in the U.S., and so in the summer of 1994, they brought me to live with them. When I first came to the U.S., I came here legally, with a tourist visa. However, when I was 14, my visa expired. I'm not an immigration lawyer, nor am I an immigration policy expert. But what I can tell you is that given the fact that I used a tourist visa to come live here, getting a new visa or renewing my expired one was likely to be impossible. So when I was 14, I had become an undocumented immigrant. My idea of Americans was really being challenged because I was beginning to feel American. But I had an expired visa, so I had become an illegal alien. So not only did I realize I'm not American, I thought maybe I'm not even human. Am I from Earth? So, you know, if it's okay with you, I am going to use the word undocumented as I tell you the rest of my story. The phrase illegal alien makes me feel as though I'm not even a real person. We all make assumptions, some conscious, some not. I had made some assumptions of who undocumented people were. The news only covered one story, 
they only told one narrative. The illegal Mexican alien, because you know, everybody south of the border is Mexican, um, who swam across the Rio Grande to take jobs from US citizens. That was the story. But I thought, I came here on a plane. I'm on my way to college. I'm part of the National Honor Society. My story is in the the story of undocumented Europeans and undocumented Canadians, the story of my parents who owned a business and employed U.S. citizens, those stories weren't being told. And more importantly, the story of the Mexican was very often dehumanizing, incomplete, and inaccurate. As high school graduation neared, my future began looking more and more hasty. It was a hard realization that in the land of opportunity, where everything is possible, where hard work is rewarded, that those truths no longer apply to me. That a piece of paper with an expiration date on it could dictate my very humanity. I was very fortunate that in 2001, Texas became the first state to allow undocumented students to attend college and university and pay in state tuition. 2001 was the year I graduated high school. And if it hadn't been for that law, which is at risk right now, I wouldn't have been able to go to college. I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. My parents also made a huge sacrifice in order for me to go to college. My mom suffered a really terrible accident, and she suffered a brain injury when I was a senior in high school. She required a lot of care, care that we could not afford alongside a college tuition bill. Because even though I was allowed to go to college, I still could not receive financial aid. And that is the case today. So my parents decided to move back with my American-born brother to Mexico so that I could use the money from our family business to pay for college. So every weekend, my freshman year in college, I took a Greyhound bus from Austin to San Antonio to sell funnel cakes. I still have the burn support to show for it. And eventually, I saved enough money to buy a car, which made the commute easier. But driving up and down I-35 gave me heart palpitations because I still didn't have a valid driver's license. So I always rode the speed limit because I didn't want to get pulled over and possibly get deported. In 2005, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. I know, I know. But you guys still have that 2008 famous Michael Captree cash. So you guys have that. Um, so I graduated from UT with honors, and I had a job offer from arguably the most prestigious investment bank in the world. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had to make a difficult decision? The kind of decision where no matter what you choose, you still feel like you're doing something wrong. Where no matter what you decide, it still doesn't feel quite right. Well, that's the kind of decision that I was faced with because I still didn't have legal documents to work in the US. There are a couple of ways in which someone can become a citizen a permanent resident who receives legal status. One way is if you are a child of U.S. citizens. Both of my parents were Mexican citizens, so I didn't qualify. Another way is to marry a U.S. citizen. But I was 21 years old. I had kissed a couple frogs, but none of them had turned into a prince yet. So that option was out. What I was left with were two choices. One was to give up on my future. The other one was to break the law. If I gave up on my future and I didn't take the offer, then the sacrifices that my parents made and the sacrifices that I made would feel pointless. And if I took the offer and I broke the law, then I knew that the consequences could be devastating. Ultimately, I decided to take the offer. It was not a decision that I arrived at lightly, and it certainly was not a decision that came, out, that came without consequences. But I felt as though if I could just work hard enough Maybe I could earn my way into America. And then it wouldn't matter that I didn't have a piece of paper that said I was. The everyday reality of going to work, however, was very different. If anybody ever looked at me kind of funny, I would think they know. They know that I'm not really supposed to be here. They know that I don't really belong here. If I was ever called to my boss's office unexpectedly, I would freak out. And I would think, today's the day that I get deported. That, was, that never happened, however. And I struggled internally to reconcile that on one hand, 
I was being promoted, I was earning raises, I was climbing the corporate ladder, I was living the American dream. And on the other hand, I couldn't apply for a credit card. I couldn't drive with a valid driver's license. I couldn't even leave the country because then I wouldn't be able to come back. In 2007, my dad passed away. He was living in Mexico. And I never got to see him alive again. Because if I left to go see him, then I wouldn't be able to come back. When someone dies that you love and you're unable to be by their side, it rocks you to the very, very core. I had decided that I would go back to Mexico because how could I continue to live in a place where no matter what I did to earn my stay, it still didn't work? But as this is true, not just for undocumented people, but I think for a lot of us, decisions are ever rarely black or white. I was dating someone at that time, and if I left to go back to Mexico, our relationship would end. I was 24. We were in love. So he proposed when we got married. Because he is a US citizen, I was able to receive legal status. I could finally work legally. I could drive with a valid driver's license. I could travel anywhere in the world. I imagined myself getting in a car and driving really fast down the highway, above the speed limit finally, because I wanted to get pulled over. And I wanted to show the police officer my driver's license and say, I belong here. I belong here now. But I was older and more mature, so I did not let those Dennis the Mendes tendencies get the best of me. So I finally had it all. I had an amazing career, a husband, legal status. And yet, I felt so lost. In trying for so many years to fit into what I thought would get me into America, I lost myself in it. Perhaps you all have lost a little bit of yourself in trying to fit in with your friends or at work. For me, my entire life had been about trying to be someone that was worthy of America. So I took a step back. I imagined starting from scratch. I asked myself, what do I really want my life to look like? Some of you might call that a midlife crisis. But for me, it was the first time in my life where I had the freedom to ask myself that question. And when I was honest with myself, I had to make some really big changes. I quit my very high six-figure paying job on Wall Street. My husband and I split after a few years. And I went on to start a scholarship fund for immigrant students in New York City called the Ascent Educational Fund that gives scholarships to students regardless of their immigration status. And I joined an organization called Define America that uses culture and media and storytelling as a way to change the lenses through which we view immigrants. And I met a lot of people who share my experience in their own individual way and who inspired me to expand my view of what it takes to be an American. Having lived in New York City for 10 years, I studied some of its history. What I found is that if these pictures of 1920s New York City that show European immigrants living in cramped tenement apartments working in sweatshops, trying to live the American dream. If these pictures tell the story of America, then these pictures of the most recent, of the most recent immigrants living in cramped labor camps, picking our crops, trying to live the American dream. If the previous pictures tell the story of America, then these pictures can't be far off of telling us who we are as a nation today. The reality is that what America is, is changing. And unless we're able to include everyone, gay, straight, rich, poor, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, immigrant, unless we're able to include everyone in our definition of America, then we are bound to miss something. We are bound to have an incomplete picture of who we are as a nation today. I'm really, really, really proud to say that on August 8, 2014, I became an American citizen. Finally and officially American. Thank you. And, thank you. and a lot of people ask me why I decided to tell my story. And the biggest reason why is because I grew tired 
of feeling ashamed and feeling embarrassed by who I am and what I've been through. I didn't want to be anonymous anymore. So I decided to come out and share my story and share how, in a way, my story and the story of the people I've met along the way help to sort of tell us who we are today. I've learned a lot of lessons in this crazy journey that I've been on, and I would like to share a couple of them. First, I learned that I am a human being, regardless of what anybody calls me. I am worth more than pieces of paper say that I am. I also learned that my dreams are worth pursuing, that I cannot let fear be my compass. As I look back, I think, what if I had never taken any risks? What if my parents had never made any sacrifices? What if I had listened to the news that told me that as an undocumented person, I could only be one thing? And today, I ask you to consider that if we were built by immigrants, and we have a Lady Liberty that says, give me your port and give me your tired and give me your photo masses that are yearning to breathe free, if that is who we are as a nation, then what if someone like me, who wasn't born here, who gave up so much because she so desperately wanted to be American, who sometimes said tree instead of free, but eventually got it right? What if someone who works really hard and pursues that dream, what if someone like that, someone like me, does in fact define America? Thank you.